<laughs> Some of us really just didn't want it. That's really too much information. We really don't want to hear it. <laughs> but whatever it was that kept you from wanting to get up, uh, you played like you were ready to play. So, <laughs> so it didn't work out. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, as I stand at your sacred desk, knowing that it's not by merit, but by amazing grace, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our collective hearts be acceptable in thy sight, for you are truly our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 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 If you have your uh, bulletin, you look on the back, I will be preaching from the Galatians reading, beginning at verse 6. And I'll read 6 through 12. Galatians chapter 1. Verses 6 through 12, and they read as follows. I am astounded that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to what we proclaim to you, let that one be accursed. As we have said before, so now I repeat, if anyone proclaims to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, let that one be accursed. I am now seeking human, am I now seeking human approval or God's approval? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still pleasing people, I would not be a servant for Christ. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, nor was it taught but I received it through a revelation of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Thus in the reading of God's word, let us consider this morning for a theme, embracing a perverted gospel. Embracing a perverted gospel. rather persuasively, that Paul's letter to the church at Galatia is perhaps the most influential in spreading the gospel of Jesus the Christ. Why do I say that? Because it is widely believed to be the book that gave birth to the Protestant Reformation that which sort of sprung open around the hills of the Enlightenment, which said that you don't just need the priest or the minister to get to Jesus. You can get to <laughs> Jesus on your own. Amen. Amen. Martin Luther, along with John Calvin, who initiated the Reformation, considered Galatians the best of all books in the Bible, saying the epistle to the Galatians is my epistle. To it I am as if it were wedded. For this reason, Galatians has been called the battle cry of the Reformation. You know, when you think about that, you know, I can almost picture Martin Luther uh, tapping the 95 theses uh, on the wall, on the door of the church at Wittenberg, and thinking to himself, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Freedom from religious dogma, freedom from spiritual stagnation, freedom from oppression. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Now, see, the Reformation changed the way in which people view their spiritual faith and the way they even approach matters of decision. And the Reformation, if you keep following that track, leads to many of our modern concepts of democracy. They, too, are rooted in the Reformation. But the passage that we just read, the Galatians were not on a path 
toward freedom. They had tasted freedom, but started to embrace some other habits that were enslaving them under the guise of being a follower of Jesus. They had doctrine. Paul had preached to them, but they did not have freedom. So when Paul heard about what he considered the Galatians' spiritual departure, he became perplexed, angry, and anxious. What they had embraced was not what he taught them. He planted the churches in Galatia not long before he wrote this letter. He was the spiritual father of the churches there. It was his preaching of the gospel that brought them into a faith with Christ. And he couldn't believe that they would be so quickly persuaded by that contingent of what he called apostolic preachers who had invaded the churches he founded. So overcome by powerful emotions, he penned this fiery letter. The book of Galatians is not long. You ought to read it sometime. And Paul, Paul, Paul's fire doesn't take long. I think, was it four chapters, I think, at most? Five. And that is the primary message that he wants them to get back to basics. Get back to the fundamentals. That's the primary message for the Galatians. It ought to be a primary message for us. Because every now and then, if you take this thing called faith for granted, mm. you kind of get off track and you, you don't really get back to basics. Mm. You know, with sports athletes, if, if, you, if you're not, say, say basketball, if, if your free throws are off, you miss your free throws, you get back to the basics. So let's start from the very basic foundation and work our way back up. That, that's what Paul is saying to the Galatians. It's what Paul ought to be saying to you and I this morning. Beginning in verse 6, Paul writes, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Unless we are willing to embrace the fundamental teachings of the faith we claim, we will still find ourselves, we will find ourselves, excuse me, clinging to a perverted gospel. A gospel, though appealing to the ear, is repulsive to the heart and soul because it possesses no power to redeem, no power to transform, no power to resurrect. Mm. It is a non-threatening gospel that does not possess the nutrients of inconvenient love. Mm. A perverted gospel is one, though it freely uses the name Jesus, bears very little resemblance. Its outcome is not, its outcome is confusion, not clarity. Chaos, not serenity. Despair, not hope. It is to have one spinning in place rather than being placed on a street called straight. It is to change one for the worse, not to make one for the better. It is a perverted gospel that supported African-American chattel slavery because it is written in Ephesians 6, 5, slaves obey your earthly masters. It is a perverted gospel that supported the Holocaust because of the notion that Jews killed Jesus. It is a perverted gospel that justifies biblically the subjugation of women based on 1 Timothy. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I don't permit women to teach or, or assume authority over men. They must be quiet. It is a perverted gospel. If you base your opposition on uh, 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 to save the gay marriage on a biblical understanding of traditional marriage, that being one man and one woman, if you're going to base it on that, you've got to know that the notion of one man and one woman stops in Genesis chapter 4. Recently, on the floor of the House of Representatives, Congressman Steve Fincher, whose company has received in the past decade, you'll like this, Larry, three and a half million dollars in government subsidies. He voted to cut food stamps. Wow. And he had, a, he, had a, he had a biblical text for it. He used 2 Thessalonians where it says, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Mm. Now, is that really the essence of the gospel? Mm. Is, is that what you got out of it? The 
cut folks' food stamps? Is that what you got? Or does Finch's words reek of perversion? See, if we lay aside the millions he receives in government subsidies, let's just put that to the side. Don't even talk about that. Are we not left with the fact that his biblical justification to cut food stamps requires that he ignore Matthew 25, whatever you do for the least of my brothers and sisters, you also do unto me? Does it not also require that you ignore Matthew 22, that you should love your neighbor as yourself? You see, church, a perverted gospel dehumanizes. It debases. It demoralizes. It depraves. It hardens. And it warps the soul. A perverted gospel is better for offering exclusion than inclusion. It is more productive at creating fragments than being a source of wholeness. It is far more effective at criticizing others than it is at being a source of transformation. And its expertise lies in expanding its selective sociological dogma and everyone having an opportunity to experience the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. How long could fish survive without water? How long could a car run without oil? I know some of you try, probably trying to find that out right now. <laughs> How long would a baseball game last if you didn't have bats, gloves, and balls? And how long could we survive with a perverted gospel? A gospel void of the sustenance of love. How long could we survive without feeding on God's word, breathing in God's spirit, reflecting God's life, sharing God's goodness, and receiving God's love? Suppose we rebel against our creator and defy our redeemer, choosing instead an alternate facsimile that is less challenging always says what we want to hear, never mind the long-term results. How far could we go? How high could we rise? How well could we get along? How long could we survive if all we had was a perverted gospel? Mm. How long before joy, peace, hope, and love are but fleeting memories of impossibility? Is it not titillation offered by the superficial aspects of the faith we embrace that are intention with the foundation on the faith that we actually possess? In other words, I, I dare say, at least in the African American tradition, you can get far more people to come home after church and tell you the sermon was good, but can't tell you what it was about. They just know they shouted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then, you, then you can to get an accurate assessment of what actually made it good. Mm, of what actually on. moved you. Right. And if we're going to talk about a, uh, a perverted gospel, we, it also assumes that everyone's in agreement with what's foundational to be a follower of Jesus' movement. But one thing we do know is that nothing that is foundational to the faith can be circumstantial. It cannot be contingent. It cannot be inferred. It cannot be conditional to some while excluding others. Mm. And the one thing, the only thing that I can see that is foundational to the faith that you and I possess, that's open to all, is the life, <coughs> death, and resurrection of Jesus. Mm. That, is the, that is the only thing I can see that's foundational to the faith. All that other stuff, when you talk in tongues, don't talk in tongues, you shout, you don't shout, you bring incense, you don't bring incense, you know, you run around the building, you stay in your place, all that. I don't know that, I know that's foundation to the faith. Come on. But the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is. Jesus cannot be domiciled by a denomination, locked in a location, chained to the church, Riven to the race or misappropriated by the masses. He does not need self appointed ventriloquists yeah. to put words in his mouth. He was here before we arrived and he'll be here long after we've left. Uh -huh. All you need to know that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Uh 